what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. Yes, indeed. What's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like Live right here on Black Power Media. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Very happy to be your host. Definitely still a minute or two left. Reach out, tell somebody to jump on in here, retweet, like, share, subscribe, join the channel, all that good stuff. Tag somebody, let them know we're about to get started here in just a minute uh, and that they should jump on in. Uh, shout out to those who are here and particularly those who remember, as was said here, the immortal words of my man, Dr. Todd Stephen Burroughs, who is responsible for me first coming to know our next guest and his work uh, and who legendarily uh, uh, in one of our classic interviews on the mighty WPFW 89.3 FM uh, uttered those immortal words in, in an invitation to discuss his work at the time in Cognigro. Uh, but before we get to that and to him, speaking of w of WPFW uh, and the great work that occurs there, I do have to, again, encourage people to consider their support for the program director there, Katia Stitt, who continues to need uh, help uh, covering her medical bills. And as I continue to say, she is all of the people that we claim we represent in struggle, that we uh, want to honor when we're speaking publicly and want to look cool and look like we're, you know, paying tribute to the real folks. Uh, this is this is them, the people that don't want the mic, that don't want the camera, that uh, do everything off record that meet, needs to be done to make movements move and survive and to make space for uh, revolutionary ideas to be discussed, uh, for radicalism to occur. Uh, so as I'm putting in, in the chat again now, the link to go support Katia Stitt. Again, you don't have to know her, and, and for many, you might not, uh, but that is sort of my point. And that's uh, in many ways, uh, I would hope irrelevant as I just wanna again, make the case for someone who works and struggles tirelessly for all of us uh, and so many more uh, that when she and others like her need that help, uh, it's obvious that it's still necessary. So let's please all chip in as much as you can uh, and show uh, love to Katia because again, without her, uh, so much of my own work would not have occurred the work of many others, even associated with BPM, would not have occurred. Uh, and so much of the great work still happening at WPFW and all throughout DC and the Pacifica Network uh, wouldn't be happening. Uh, and so much more. I mean, that's just a very limited, you know, even view of this, this great woman. Uh, so please share the link, put a couple of dollars on it and uh, um, help out as best you can. All right. So I've put his more full bio in the show notes below, but uh, let's go ahead and get right to it. Because as I said, our first time uh, uh, meeting, so to speak, was through those airwaves at WPFW in Washington, D.C. And of course, I'm talking about Dr. Frank Wilderson, who, among many other things, uh, uh, is a professor at UC Irvine and has publications like Red, White and Black Cinema and the Structure of U.S. Antagonisms. And of course, as I mentioned at the top, he wrote Incognito, a memoir of exile and apartheid. And we are talking today about his most recent book, Afro Pessimism, uh, a theoretical approach to the world uh, for uh, that he is um, credited and I think rightfully so as founding or being its most prominent spokesperson. So Frank Wilderson, welcome back. It's good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jared. Oh, it's great to be back with you. And Shout out to Todd and Dr. Haight, too. <laughs> no doubt. Absolutely. Our original crew. 
and uh and, and look i'll put some i gotta add those links to the show notes for this as well because uh i would encourage people to go check out a lot of those discussions that will probably cover things we won't get to today uh my favorite among which is your incognito memoir and of course all the discussions we've had about chris hani in particular uh, uh, you know, I'll, you know, people should go check all that out. So anyways, good to see you. Thank you again for coming through. Um, as I was joking with you, well, not, you know, somewhat joking with you, you know, my, my presumed or, or real association with you has been causing me so many problems, uh, uh, and raising so many questions for so many people for so long. And, uh, you know, and I wanted to start with, you know, a, a couple of years ago, I did an interview with Dr. Lewis Gordon. Uh, and, and I have to be honest at the time, I did not understand the depths of his disagreement with you and your work. I didn't understand, you know, uh, um, uh, so when he came on and we had this interview, he was right in his critique of me that when he said that a lot of people who are critical of the critics of Afro pessimism, haven't read the criticism. Uh, and at that time I certainly hadn't engaged much of it at all. Uh, and I, and as I kept saying, look, I, I, my engagement with Frank is largely around incognito, the politics you represent in that memoir, the, the worldview you represent in that memoir still is, is to me tremendously appealing. So I was never claiming to be an expert in Afro pessimism in favor or as a critic, but I just thought, you know, it just seemed at, it just seemed odd to me. Some of the criticisms I was hearing of your work. So, it, which would include, for instance, uh, uh, you know, some of the more easy stuff, the dismissal of, of feminism, Marxism, Marxism, et cetera, and so forth, the, the, or, or, or discussing the limitations of, of those uh, theoretical approaches. But the biggest ones are that your argument uh, is discouraging of political activism, uh, uh, that it's just saying we should just give up and not struggle, and that it, it prohibits uh, uh, solidarity with other, particularly non-white, colonized struggles and peoples moving in, in their movements. So, when in a recent interview, and, I'll, and I will get, I, I'm going to stop this long preamble in a minute. Well, I'm but I just wanted. I'm listening. I'm listening. No, I hear you. I no, I hear you. But 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 uh, uh, in a recent interview I did with Nora Erikat, uh, the Palestinian lawyer and activist, she she uh, had. It, Put me in, t you know, she put me up on an interview that she had done with Mark Lamont Hill, where where our interview for some years ago, one of them, a transcript of them, was used uh, as a way to discredit Afro pessimism as, a, as and to say that Afro pessimism encourages a lack of solidarity. And in that excerpted piece, you were saying, uh, 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 um, uh, and the, I don't know, the transcript rang true to my memory, at least, You're, you, you know, what you, what you were basically saying is that, listen, Palestinians uh, will work with them and we'll struggle with them. But at, at, after we get them over at free from Israel, we're going to have to check them on their anti-blackness. And I said, I agreed. But this was extrapolated to mean that there can be no solidarity. And I've heard this many times. People have said this to me a lot. And I've always said, but I don't get that from your work. Now, it is true. I don't understand everything, including your latest book. I'm not going to claim to understand it all. We'll get to that in a minute. But but uh, so I wanted to really just start right there. Can you just clarify before we get into the the, the depth as much as possible of your, your of the theory? Are you dis are, is your argument intending to discourage black people from struggling uh, at all, uh, from appreciating their their uh, radical um, political uh, histories? Uh, and are you saying that there should be no solidarity with other folks? Because to the point about Lewis Gordon, since then, I have read a good number of the critics critics. And on these issues. I don't understand or agree with their what they're saying in terms of how they interpret your work. But but anyway, so let's just start there. Are you saying any of that in your work, intending to at least? Absolutely not. However, I do understand how it could be perceived as my having said that, because most people come at a unequivocally black cry and, a, and an unapologetically black analysis of everyone else in other words people come people in people experience us looking at them analytically as an assault on them and and so what happens is that afro pessimism is an analytic interpretation 
of everyone else's capacity. I'll repeat that, an analytic interpretation of everyone else's capacity. And just as Marx condemns the capacity of the capitalists, whether it's a good capitalist like George Soros, who uh, is actually, uh, I want to give a shout out to George Soros because um, he's, he's a part of the, the, the distribution network for Afro-pessimism when he poured millions of dollars into uh, urban, uh, urban debate camps. What he did is he is he created a he created a, a, a pipeline for Afro pessimist texts to be um, infused in the inner city without even knowing what he did. So so thank you, my man. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> but 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 what I'm trying to say is that what I don't give a fuck about. Can I swear on here? Absolutely. Okay. I really <laughs> don't care that the sentimental response to the analytic critique clouds the other person's capacity to understand the analysis. I, I think that we, ha- for, for, for hundreds of years, we have reached across the water and tried to help these people understand our suffering and understand their relationship to it. And that's a, that's a, uh, that's a kind of cosmic um, manifestation that, that began you know, over 1400 years ago in the Bantu migration, it's called Ubuntu which means goodwill and compassion and and love of the other. And so what you can say, what you can rightfully say is that there is no Ubuntu in Afro-pessimism. It's just a cold gaze. But that doesn't mean that it's actually saying what other people experience it to be saying. Uh, Solidarity is, is, I mean, I've, I've, you know, I'm checking myself now at 65 on on my solidarity, I'm, I'm, I'm fucking sick of it. Uh, I have struggled in more people's uh, oppression contexts who are not black over the past 53 years than I have in decidedly black struggles. And so attitudinally, I don't have any more um, energy or um, compassion uh, for someone who can't see that, um, what you just said at the very beginning, that Israel is a blight on, if not the world, the Middle East, you know, the United States is a blight on the world, and, and Israel is is a extension of that blight. And um, so much in the Middle East would be restabilized, restabilized, if Israel did not exist. But that restabilization would not do anything essential for the liberation of Black people. And I did a six hour uh, um, Afro pessimist workshop for 35 activists slash leaders of Black Lives Matter from Pennsylvania, New York City, and uh, in New Jersey back in 2016. This was at the, actually the Audubon Ballroom, which is now the Malcolm X uh, Shabazz Foundation. And in that in that um, six hour workshop, the Black Lives Matter people talked to me about a sojourn they took to Palestine for two weeks in which uh, they were going with this whole idea that Ferguson is Palestine. And before they went, they had asked the Palestinians in Gaza if they could meet, and Ramallah, if they could meet uh, Black Palestinians. And they were told, yes. And when they got there, they were redirected for, for, for almost 10 days away from meeting any Black Palestinians. And when they finally put their foot down and insisted that they do that, they had one-on-ones with Black Palestinians who talked about the structural feeling of anti-blackness that they experience in a community that's being bombed every day by the Israelis, okay? They didn't talk about Israeli anti-blackness. They talked about Palestinian anti-blackness. I had the same experience when I spent six weeks in Cuba, you know, and and this is, and I'm really sick and tired of people, you know, and, and, what, and what I mean by that is is I was uh, with, with uh, Medea Benjamin's group, um, Global Exchange uh, in Cuba for six weeks. And um, we were 13 Americans, three of us black, um, and we were paired with two young communists 
And we went all around the island together for, for that period. And we met with government officials and went to hospitals. It was a groovy experience. And then at one point, the Black Cubans said, we would like a session with the Black Americans, just the, black, just the three Black Americans. And so three Black Americans met with about eight Black Cubans out of that 26 group of Black Cubans. And the white people from the United States, the 10 white people were like, okay, cool. We'll go on a bus, a field trip for a day. So y'all can have the crib. We lived in this big house in Verdada, which was a rich neighborhood that had been subdivided for poor people. But the white Cubans were like, what the hell is going on? Uh, we're all communists here. We're all, you know, and so, and then, and to, and to make matters even worse, this is what I, this is why psychoanalysis is so important to, to, to Afro-pessimism, because the force of the unconscious is what you described to me in your opening remarks. And the force of the unconscious actually doesn't have any relational dynamic to it. The force of the unconscious is such that these three Black Americans, one of them was fluent in Spanish. Another one was taking intermediate Spanish. I was taking beginning Spanish, okay? But because I was the oldest, I guess, I don't know, or maybe the darkest, I don't know, but the white Cubans vamped on me and demanded that I come to some kind of luncheon tribunal with them where they accuse me of fomenting racial divisions on the island. This is, this is a global phenomenon where, where these people feel victimized by our um, critique of their capacities to be and often of how they use their capacities. And I'm very sorry, Afro-pessimism is about them. It is not to them. There's been too many hundreds of years of Ubuntu where we have said, okay, how are you feeling about this? How are you experiencing this? Okay, I don't give a rat's ass anymore. So on that regard, they're right. But, I, but in terms of the analytic, they're absolutely wrong because I've done nothing but solidarity work throughout my whole goddamn life. So what about also the, the specific criticism that uh, Afro-pessimism dismisses the, the Black liberation movement? The all of the work, all of the the George Jackson work, all of the the, the BLA work, all of the you know Asada, et cetera, um, and then even this other thing. By the way, I just you don't have to respond to this. This is up to you. But I I I, I forgot to mention that the reason I eventually took down the Lewis Gordon video, which is I think the only video I've ever willfully took down. By the way, my my bad, my bad, my bad, my bad, my bad. Please forgive me, everybody. Just real quick, the the remix show from uh, Thursday, a couple people have asked about it. Uh, Google took it down. YouTube took it down. Alphabet took it down. Uh, and I suspect it was because of the uh, sort of naturalist discussion around responses to COVID. Uh, and even though I have already said I am vaccinated and I'm on the side of the people I interviewed the other day, uh, the, the medical practitioners that encourage us to get vaccinated, I am not I am not in favor of censorship. So I'm not cool that they took our shit down. I am not cool that they took our video down, even if I disagree with the particular message in the video. But that's what happened, by the way. My, the reason I'm bringing that up here, Frank, is because I took down the only time I willfully took down a video that I can think of, at least, is the Lewis Gordon video, because um, not because he disagreed with you, but because he insinuated that your story about your experience in South Africa was not true. And when I asked him to come back on, I felt like after the interview, I thought, man, I, I let that go. I felt uncomfortable. So I reached back out to him and said, would you come back on and either lay out your evidence or, you know, take it back or whatever. Uh, he basically said, no, long story short, he said no. So I took the video down. So that's why I, the, I just, I just, <laughs> yeah, I hear you. you I just, know. I just, did, it just didn't, it, did, it didn't sit right with me. If you have evidence that Frank is lying, then say it. Otherwise, I don't think it's fair to disparage the argument by suggesting his personal story is not true when you have no evidence to say it. Um, I should have checked it in at the moment when it happened. I didn't. And then, so I, anyway, tried to correct it coming back and, and he didn't want to, um, engage going far farther than that. So, you know what, um, that's, that's okay. Because I, I will tell you this, I was hired 
and fired almost on the same day in 2005 at the University of California, Irvine, because uh, a, a, a cat named David Theo Goldberg, who is a white South African, said the very same thing about me and put that shit in the dean's ear. And then she rescinded my provisional hire based upon the fact that I was being called Jason Blair in advance, the, the dude who made up stories uh, a oh. long time ago. And um, what happened was, thank you very much to Professor Joy James, because I had made $20,000 the year before as a graduate student, okay? Um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not anywhere near that low now, okay? And I didn't have the money to pursue that. And Joy James loaned me $2,000 to get a lawyer to sue the University of California, Irvine. Um, and my wife, Anita Wilkins, who was not my wife at the time, was on sabbatical in South Africa in 1992. And in her uh, travel journals that she has from all over the world, she has a very detailed description of a meeting where Nadine Gordimer, the Nobel laureate, had nominate me, me, nominated me to take her place at the, at the annual convention of the Congress of South African Writers on the executive board. And I there were 100 delegates and I won by 99 vo votes. Uh, then an ANC uh, official in the government of Pretoria wrote a letter about my participation. And the other thing that they said I was lying about was that they said, Samuel Jackson never performed your work at the Negro Ensemble in 1988. Okay, which was actually on HBO. So I have experienced this for almost 20 years now, and it's it's nothing new. Um, I think that, you know, I went to South Africa. There are 100 Black people uh, uh, living there. No, 100 Americans living there, living permanently there when I went. And most of them were doing stuff for either the State Department or USAID or NGOs. And I joined the ANC, you know? And so I'm happy about that. And um, there are people who have actually supported my claims. I, I've documented uh, verification of all that, you know? Go ahead, I, I, I just had to get No, that I mean, it's cool, I appreciate that. I just, I was just saying, you know, the other thing I'm, I'm on the record is saying, by the way, on that issue, just for the record again, is that, uh, uh, look, I can't, I couldn't prove one way or another, uh, and I ultimately don't care. And, you know, if, if uh, you know, what you did politically with Incognito was enough for me. So, so if, 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 uh, uh, anyway, that's where my bias is that, that the argument you lay out in there, the, the history you draw out in there, the views of the struggle in South Africa that you put on that. Um, I, I'm like, you know, to me, I don't mean to disrespect your, 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 your real life and your, what you're saying about your real life. I'm just saying, even if it wasn't true, I, I, I wouldn't get I, <laughs> it makes a damn difference. Um, but cause my point is let's talk about what he's saying and, uh, politically, and that's ultimately where, where, so the last point that before we get to, 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 uh, by the way, your critics would also say that in terms of your point about Soros, that uh, in fact, because Lewis Gordon in another video I saw did make this point that your work is is being used to destroy the debate scene for black youth. Uh, so when you say Soros is the one putting it there, a lot of people would say, so that's that's evidence right there, because Soros is seen by a lot, including myself, as not a positive influence on uh, 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 certainly black radical struggle. So uh, um, what I just said, as with, with the tone yeah. of irony, if George, I hear you. if George Soros and I, I, I think we got to say it very clearly without being ironic. If George Soros and I sat down, we could not agree on lunch. He's just a dirty liberal ass capitalist to me. He did something accidentally, like a good liberal. He tried to help some Negroes in the ghetto form debate camps. They picked up the work and began it. So this is the only, here's what I think people are pissed off about. Afro-pessimism has one addressee, one addressee, which is black people who are sick and tired. It doesn't have three addressees, such as Native Americans, black people, 
Palestinians, Latinx immigrants. It has one addressee. Now anybody can read it because it's in English, but it is not written to anybody. It is only written to black people who are ready to set it off or interested in setting it off or privately disturbed by what they're going through in life and they can't say it publicly. It, and, and I think that what people say is, you should be writing to a wide range of people. You should be writing to a wide range of, of cognitive perceptions. And I just say, no, absolutely. Well, it's also, with, well, I mean, it's, it's also that you might, it's also not might, you are said to be writing to an academic intelligentsia, so to speak, uh, that when you're saying you're writing to black audiences, it's, it's not, it's not all black audiences. Uh, yeah, but I would, say, it's, it's, I would say, I would say, I would say two things. One, this book changes the, the paradigm or that, mm. that this is a trade book. But I would also say, I would also say that people have to really pay close attention to, to what they're saying. It, that it, we have suffered slings and arrows in the academy for trying to get this out. Okay, it has not been it has not been well received in the academy. That's number one. Number two, what people are not who say that are not actually getting to is the fact that there are I've been to personally black community centers in Los Angeles, black community centers in Oakland, black community centers in uh, black Montreal, black community centers in Vienna, Austria, where semi degreed and undegreed people are reading early Afro-pessimism and understanding that the energy and the affect is with them and that the only thing that they have to get over is like the instrument, like John Coltrane getting over the instrument is the words and the language. I worked in Soweto with kids who were going home and going to the United Nations Food Bank and bringing grains of 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 of, of, of grain, bags of grain to their homes, and then coming back to school in, in a place called Pimville, a part, a part of Soweto, where we would have Antonio Gramsci reading groups. Okay, and you know how hard that language is. Okay, and all those kids brought a thesaurus, and we sat around and we got through it. Okay, so mm. all those people who are talking this this smack is is really, it's just their way of of degrading what we're doing without looking at the hardcore evidence. There are people in the ghettos who are reading, who are reading this work before this book came out. Mm. Well, uh, I've, I've said some of the trouble you've caused me. One of the good things you caused by, especially this visit this morning or this afternoon is that um, uh, my, my brother, I'm just seeing it and I'm late to it. So I'll get the response to you shortly, but, but shout out to Luke Stewart. Uh, also a WPFW, whose uh, 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 radical jazz listening group uh, is is checking this out and looking to extend the conversation in their group uh, beyond today. So I appreciate that, and they're very excited for this discussion. Uh, so I appreciate that in them and uh, Luke in particular, real good brother over there, PFW. Uh, uh, so anyway, so thanks for that, Frank. It was it was it gave Luke an excuse to to reach out to me after some time. That's that's what's up. Um, one more thing on the, I did want to ask you when I was looking up, when I was doing all the, re, not all the reading, that's, let me, let me rephrase that. When I was trying to do some of the reading of the criticism so that to, to address what I thought was right, what Lewis Gordon said to me, at least for me, like I had not really read that much of it. Um, one of the things I saw was that, uh, that, that piece where Orlando Patterson is quoted in the times is sort of dismissing your take on his, 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 uh, um, his, uh, social death uh, analysis. Did you ever respond to that or did you have any thoughts on that? Or, or does that does that mean anything or, or how, or what, what, what do you do with that? Um, first of all, I thank Orlando Patterson for a groundbreaking work, Slavery and Social Death. I mean, there, there, there are certain books that are out there that we could not have formulated this analysis of black suffering. That's all it is. It's an analysis of black suffering. It is not a blueprint of what to do about that suffering. It is not um, a historical kind of account of that suffering. It is not a sociological intervention of that suffering. It's an, it's an analytic. It's like looking at a piece on the chessboard, 
that's a queen, and looking at another piece on a chessboard, that's a pawn, and saying, before anything happens, what is the capacity of, of the queen? And what is the capacity of the pawn? <laughs> That's all. That's all we're doing, okay? And what? And so, and so, I think that there are people who who are alive and dead, who intend to do more in their work, and we have taken this little nugget from their work to expand our project, and they don't like it. I mean, I think I've I've heard through the grapevine that Hortense Spillers has had some issues, and we could not be anywhere and anything without her work. Uh, I know that Frantz Fanon, who is a humanist, uh, is rolling around in his grave every time we mobilize him. And the way I say to that is that, well, Fanon, you know, wait for David Marriott to die. And when David Marriott dies and gets to heaven, he will teach you how to read your work a little bit better. Okay. Oh, damn. <laughs> and but you can see why people would be like, Frank, come on, man. That sounds. <laughs> When my crew dies, we're gonna get there and tell Fanon how to better read his own work. That's yeah, that's and, and, that's and, gangster. And, 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 yeah, yeah, it is. But the reason I say that, <laughs> the reason I say that is because so many black writers, me included, although I'm like this in person, but not like this on the page. So many black writers are so traumatized by the by the comprehensive scope of black suffering as they look at it. That went, that by the time they get to what I would call metaphorically the end of the book, they say, how can I put some relief in this book? How can I put some redemption? How can I put some hope? As opposed to saying, hey, I'm going to cut it off right here and let Black people in the streets figure out what to do with that. That's why I think there's a hope in Afro-pessimism, because we... I believe Afro-pessimism does something for revolution, which frees the imagination of Black people to the point where you can look at yourself and, 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 and engage your imagination without having to ask yourself, how is my desire going to affect the non-Black person next to me? No, I'm for solidarity, but it's not a two-way street. It is that's and that's where and this is where the and, and this is where, where okay I'm I'm gonna get gangster on you right okay because it is not a two way street it is incumbent upon them to figure out how they can be in solidarity with black people not incumbent upon us to figure out how we can be in solidarity with them and it's precisely because as I said in the opening chapter of this book that the unconscious of the Palestinian is structured by the same anti-Blackness as the unconscious of the Israeli. It just so happens that economically and territorially, the Palestinian is suffering. So provisionally, we're down with him, her, or them until they stabilize something. But once they stabilize something, we're going to have to destroy what they've actually created. So... Precisely because their capacity to be is dependent upon our ongoing destruction of our capacity to be. Now, that's an argument. It's not a sentiment. Now, there are two, if I remember correctly in your book, there are two stories you tell that make, that address this point. One, so if you if you could, because this is so, so quickly, I agree. Reading Afro pessimism, I enjoyed it. I'm not going to say I understand everything. I'm not going to say I agree with everything, but I enjoyed it. Uh, uh, and it was it, it didn't it it was not the the it, it was not the I guess the intellectual heavy lift that you you know some of your other works have been. Um, uh, Incognito, notwithstanding, I, that was you took me back to that. So I appreciate that you made you know you made it easy for some of us or, or whatever whatever you had to do. I appreciated that. Um, but there are two these, these two stories. One where you where you're sitting with 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 the Palestinian, and he makes the comment about the Ethiopian Jew, which which if you would if if, if I'm understanding your if I understood it, you might want to maybe quickly allude to here. And then the the other one about oh now I'm forgetting the details about the it was was one of them a Sudanese there, there was they they got into a fight and then uh, um. 
Oh man, I look for this. Fought with the Ku- Kuwaitis. Uh, that's what it was. That's yeah, what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, but in each case, but in each of these stories, they kind of tell the, the they, they explain the point that you're making about the not the lack of a two way street uh, to, to, yeah. to to blackness. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, look. Let's let's be let's be very clear. Um, and this is another controversial point. What is blackness? Some people. And I mean, what is what is what what are we trying to say here about the black as a position? We're not saying that blackness is devoid of all of the cultural and linguistic accoutrement that comes, say, from um, uh, that even that even someone that that I have issues with, like Ron Karenga would bring up, or or comes from pan africanism we're not we're not dismissing that we're actually asking this the question that fanon asks in the opening chapter of the wretch of the earth he says the native does not always tell the truth the native is the truth and then he says what is the native the truth of the native is the truth of the settlers undoing and what he means by that he doesn't mean how do algerians think about themselves how do Algerians feel about occupation? How do Algerians feel about communism? How do Algerians feel about Islam? He simply means that there has been a structural wrong done to Algerians, and they and they embody that in their in their corporeal reality in their bodies. And if you were to right that wrong, then the category of the settler and the native would be destroyed, and we'd be into a new world. And that's all we're saying. That's how we're saying is that anti-blackness is the embodiment, sorry, blackness is many, many things, but the one thing that it that is the truth of it at the core, not the totality, the truth, is that it is the embodiment of a kind of violence and positioning that cannot be reconciled, cannot be analogized with the violence that is suffered by other kinds of people. That's an argument. We get that argument by extending and distending the calculus of Fanon, by extending and distending the calculus of Orlando Patterson. Orlando Patterson has said, people, stop thinking about slavery as a historical event. People, stop thinking about slavery as people chopping cotton. People, stop thinking about slavery as people in chains and whips. Think of slavery the way Marx thought of capitalism as a relational dynamic. And that was a brilliant breakthrough. The only problem is that he says that everyone was at some point not a slave and then became a slave. And what we're arguing is that black comes into being through the vamping on East Africa by Arabs, Moroccan Jews, Chinese, Iranians, Iraqis, and East Indians. That black doesn't exist before a global consensus that Africa is a place of slaves. What exists before black is Ashanti, Buganda, Maasai, Kikuyu, okay? So what we have argued is that black is essentially a paradigm, just like worker is not a cultural position. Worker is a paradigm. There are workers who speak Spanish. There are workers who speak Swedish. There are workers who are gay. There are workers who are straight. Those are cultural identities. And we're saying, we're arguing, okay, y'all don't like that? Show us black before social death. Just show us. Just show us. Because you know what? I'd like to go away somewhere to the Mediterranean and be a poet and study oceanography. I don't want to do this shit, okay? But is but 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 there's but there's an essential dynamic of suffering, which is not only our suffering, but it is necessary for everybody else to formulate who they are. And that's what I was saying anecdotally with the Palestinian. He's grieving about a cat who is his cousin who's making a bomb in a basement in Ramallah. I'm grieving next to him because I'm down with that cause. It's 1988. There's no Afro pessimism. I'm just a straight up head internationalist Marxists, right? And uh, all of a sudden, he starts telling stories about Israeli occupation. And he says, it is so humiliating 
to get at a checkpoint and they just run their hands over you and they run their hands, in his words, over our women, right? Okay, and I'm like, yeah, right on. You know, he says, but you know what the most humiliating thing is? When an Ethiopian Jew runs his hands over you. Okay, that says to me, it is a symptomatic truth that in the collective unconscious of everyone in the world, the black exists as a threat. That's 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 just, you know, I can prove that. I can So why do you think he was saying that to you though? He wasn't saying it to me. He was saying it to the sky. He was mm. what I'm trying to say is that he was in a he was in a condition of crying, grieving. He was we were sitting on a hill overlooking downtown Minneapolis and he was speaking out. I didn't have to be there. It was it was a psychoanalytic moment. It was the force of his, if he was looking at me and conversing with me, he would not have said that. See, but this is the, but this is, this is where, this is where I personally, and I think beyond, you know, me keep running into issues. So, so when I read your work and I'm sitting in, I'm reading Afro pessimism and I'm sitting, I'm enjoying it and I'm not finding, I mean, um, uh, whatever I might disagree with, I don't even know exactly what, how I would phrase it or what it would be, but it would certainly not be in sort of um, not recognizing the stories that you share, for instance. In other words, when you when you lay out those stories, they're very they're reminiscent of so many of my my own. I'm sure any anybody else's, any number of other black people would have experienced versions of this. Uh, um, and I'm gonna get to the mixed question before we leave. Don't worry, I'm gonna get to that. But but. Um, uh, but, but for instance, you know, I, you know, and it, I got, in, you know, I got into an argument in an email chain where it was presented to a group of black radicals, your, your recent article in the nation magazine, uh, and where you, where you outlined sort of what you say in, in Afro pessimism is, is the, what you call the meta theory, the critical project uh, by deploying blackness as a lens of interpretation, inter which inter that that I'm adding interrogates the unspoken un assumptive logic of Marxism, postcolonialism, psychoanalysis, and feminism through rigorous theoretical consideration of their properties and assumptive logic, et cetera, and so forth. My point is, you 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 um, put that on display in that Nation article, uh, and one of the things that, that, and as I said, I think to you in an email was that that the 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 first thing that not that I disagree with anything you said in the article, other than that it was in the Nation. And that this is part of the, the what is used in the cr criti criticism of your work in some circles. So, for instance, uh, as I was saying a moment ago about George Soros, George Soros wouldn't pick, uh, you know, a, a black Marxist, uh, a, a, a Marxist Leninist, you know, black liberation, uh, you know, uh, text to distribute. Uh, the Nation magazine isn't publishing many overtly radical, you know, black Marxists and militants of that nature. Um, Medea Benjamin isn't hanging out with a, a lot of these same folks either. Uh, so, so when your name and work comes up in association with these spaces, it seems, you know, on some level people would say, and this is where I wanted to go with this next question is, uh, um, uh, that as a, a, a stereotypically traditional, um, or coming out of the stereotypical traditional, uh, uh lineage of cultural nationalism and race first analysis, uh, wouldn't it be easier, and isn't it often easier for white liberals in particular to associate themselves with that than anything uh, black and radically materialist? Uh, so, so in other words, it, what I also think is just a, a criticism of your work that goes unsaid is that you're offering what for many is simply put a race first analysis that many people don't think is expansive enough or radical enough. Um, anyway, please respond to any of that, uh, if you would. Uh, uh, I don't know. What do people want me to be? You know, slothful and, and, and hand out leaflets on the fucking corner? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> what I think they would want to say is, shouldn't we all acknowledge when, when, even if it's not our intent, that our work is being recognized, appreciated, or even misused by people who would be well-funded and be in position yeah. to well-fund us? Shouldn't I'm we be critical of that? I, I I am I have been I can I continue to be I mean look I I I operate in a vertically integrated range of spaces uh, 
I operate at Research One institutions, and like I put to, to before, I operate in community centers in in the in the in the in the inner city. Um, Incognito, you know, was uh, slated for a fifty thousand dollar advance in two thousand and 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 six by by Simon and Schuster, and and the uh, publisher. Uh, just came down to the editorial room uh, within hours of them supposed to fax me the contract and said, I haven't been down here in 30 years, but I'm telling you, you're not publishing this book. I'm not giving you a reason why. Uh, Harper Collins was going to give me $35,000. And the sales force came the day that we were supposed to do the deal and said, we're not bringing this shit to, 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 to our, our, our co you know, buyers at, at Barnes and Noble. Um, you know, I at at, at 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 Beacon Press, they said take out all the shit dealing with white women, and we'll and we'll publish this. You know, for seven thousand five hundred dollars, uh, two black, two. You know, then it went dormant for two years because I had spent the advance from 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 Beacon, and and then uh, 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 South End Press, which had been which had become black through uh, Asha Tal and um, Jocelyn Burrell. They published it and, and they said, you know, we can only give you, uh, you know, we only give $1,500 to like Bell Hooks and, and Noam Chauncey. <laughs> we give you $500 for this. I said, we got a bigger problem. I don't own my book. Okay. You got to get $4,000 over to, to, to Beacon before. And they paid, those black women paid the money and they upped it to $1,500. And I hit the phones for three months. In, in in the in the spring of 2008, and I I would uh, from my stockbroker, I would dial 100 uh, bookshops a, a day, get 30 contacts, make three deals, and I got a book tour. And then Johnson Burrell put in four thousand dollars for me to come to New York, and that's partly how that whole thing, the East Coast, how I met you. So what I'm trying to say is that um, I am not a darling of the establishment. Okay. Um, it's because it's largely because Afro pessimism has taken off in the black community. What people don't see is that so from 2006 until 2018, this was largely an underground movement where we were working only in black spaces. It's only now, with the death of George Floyd, which came two years after I got the contract, and the fact that Afro pessimism picked up as a trade book that um, all these people who forgot these terrains who forgot how they treated me in the past are coming are coming back you know so i really i really think that that's an unsophisticated critique that somehow i live in these rarefied spaces and uh where i'm eating caviar with the heads of state and 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 publishing houses it's it's just i'm vertically integrated in my interactions and it's and I've suffered a lot and had to claw my way to where I'm at. I don't, and I make no apologies for that. No, right on. Fair enough. Uh, um, so what is this, this, the, 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 the biggest thing that I struggle with in Afro pessimism is this master slave piece. Like how, you know, uh, uh, you know, never mind. You know, you're criticized for your for your wife. I'm criticized for my mother. Never mind all of these relationships that 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 we have, uh, willfully or not, with white folks. How is it that it, that this this master slave thing is so permanent? And then how could you engage on any level with white folks if if from your understanding and their their perspective, all we can ever be is enslaved or a slave? Well, I don't. The last question is a question that haunts me day and night, mm -hmm. but I refuse to answer it because if I answered it, I would be, you know, having having said that, and now I'm going to get a little theoretical, which mm -hmm. goes back to the other work, you know, what constitutes a relational dynamic? And the, the essence of what constitutes a relational dynamic is that I am not black, okay? And so to 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 be able to form relations is to not be black. That doesn't mean that black people don't desire relations, don't have 
um, what Jared Sexton, who actually, had he not asked the question, what if we looked at the essential antagonism through anti-Blackness in 99, 2000, we wouldn't be here today. I mean, he, he asked that question in a reading group. Um, it doesn't mean that, that in the other parts of the Black psyche, there's not a, a desire to be a relational being. There's not a desire to have violence and, and um, aggression fomented against us for contingencies, for reasons. One desires all of that. What we're saying is that if that were possible for Black people, then it would not be possible for anybody else. To know who I am in the world as a human being, I have to know that I am not Black. That is that is a basic that is a basic extension of, of, of a analytic that undergirds psychoanalysis, which is called semiotics. I won't get all, all into it, but it suggests that words and concepts do not have organic relationships to the thing. If I say to my students, what is this? And they say, this is a book. And I say, okay, now book me for a crime and they throw it at me, then they would not be able to cross the bar of metaphor. In other words, words are constantly sliding and the only way they get meaning, the only way one gets meaning in one's life is in contradistinction to someone else. The key part here is that the N word and the black body has no transformative capacity. Now this is a controversial point and we're not gonna have a way of, of backing it up in the short time that we have, but the transfer, the trans transformational capacity of blackness comes through blackness's capacity to move towards the end of the world to a new dynamic which cannot be imagined this is what makes this is and I, and I will stand by this not just because I've written analytic articles about it but because just like my Palestinian friend everyone understands that blackness is a threat without an idea Fanon wrote this. Fanon wrote this. He says to Sartre, the Jew is a threat conceptually. One has to wait to see if they act like a Jew, if they perform Jewishness. The black is a threat corporally, the body, not the ideas. This is why I try to get across the nation piece. And Ehrlichman said it to Nixon, right? We are not against Black people's ideas. Black people don't have any ideas. I don't mean we don't have ideas. What I mean is we don't have any auditors. And that's what makes Black people crazy, thinking that somebody's listening, somebody can hear, somebody will judge me for my actions. My Palestinian friend, the unconscious doesn't allow that to happen. And I'm sorry if that hurts people, it hurts me too. But we have spent 20 years carefully analyzing that dynamic. And nobody has come up with an analytic rebuttal to that. They've all come up with, this hurts solidarity. This makes me feel bad. This is a way of being race first. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm no, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just not able, I won't deal with people's emotional problems. I got my own. In fact, you say uh, uh, if 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 mm, if as Afro pessimism argues, blacks are not human subjects, but but are instead structurally inert props, implements for the execution of white and non-black fantasies and sadomasochistic pleasures. Then this is also this also means that at a higher level of abstraction, the claims of universal humanity that the above theories all subscribe to are hobbled by a meta aporia, a contradiction that manifests whenever one looks seriously at the structure of black suffering in comparison to the presumed universal structure of all sentient beings. Um, and you say this in response to your your explanation as to why. Marxism, or your quick summary as to why Marxism, post-colonialism, psychoanalysis, and feminism uh, uh, are ultimately insufficient uh, in ex in explaining or, or or resolving the problem. Um, why isn't uh, uh, Afro pessimism? Uh, by, by the way, just very quickly, shout out to Joy James. You mentioned her, and I forgot to just come back and double that double down on that. 
um, much respect uh, to, to, to Dr. Joy James. Uh, and, you know, you use the analogy earlier of the queen in the pawn that, that, that about what is uh, possible for each and, and, and to understand the, you know, sort of the world that, that uh, a challenge to blackness ultimately leads to the end of, we have to appreciate or at least understand what are supposed to be the, the, the potentials of each. But, but again, the critics of your work would often argue that you don't give room to recognize, to borrow your analogy, that in chess, the pawn can become a queen. Um, that transformation, that radical transformation seems to be lost in your work. Now, again, as I said, I've never read your work and certainly in the interviews we've done, I don't know how many, I mean, I don't know, approaching, I don't know how, I don't know, however many at this point, but I've never walked away feeling anything but inspired to the most radical political behavior. Yet, uh, um, it, again, it is persistent and I don't, and maybe it's because the term pessimism is in, is in the title, but, but that, that many take this away. Uh, but, um, Again, even reading this most recent work, which which you know is in, in I guess in, in a part two, another memoir of sorts. I don't know a, a, a different part of your life. Uh, there's nothing in there that says we can't. That I take meaning we can't struggle, we can't we can't fight, we shouldn't do this, we shouldn't do that. Uh, anyway, but yeah, well, okay. So very quickly, um, pessimism is not. In Afro pessimism, and this is, I understand how people get this wrong because we haven't actually come out explicitly and we haven't had time, you know, to, to answer because because there's more slings and arrows coming at us than people saying, oh, hey, look, check this out. And your pessimism is not meant to connote an emotional dispensation. Pessimism is meant to connote an attitude towards the emancipatory horizon of Marxism, feminism, fem post-colonialism, and psychoanalysis. In other words, it's, it's, it's really like hijacking a phrase from Antonio Gramsci, who says, I have a pessimism of the intellect and an optimism of the will. By that, he means I have a pessimism of the bourgeois economists and the social democrats who analyze Italy's problems in a half-assed way, but I have an optimism of the factory workers in Turin who are occupying the factories. So we have a pessimism of the, of the, the capacity of Marxism, feminism, Afro, uh, um, psychoanalysis, um, to, and postcolonialism to think through the essence of black suffering. It's a pessimism of that of their intellectual projects. We have an optimism of black people's capacity to move, to set it off. Okay, so that's one thing. Getting back to the pawn queen thing. Okay, so, so my own work in particular, um, and and I is most Afro pessimism is, is weighted towards an analysis of capacity, even though. It does a lot of other things in in the work itself. You know, Jared Sexton's work talks. He, he's basically saying in amalgamation schemes, look, I have a white mother and a and a black father. However, I know in this movement, whether you take a, a broadside from a political movement or an academic book from some mixed race person who's writing about the 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 um, you know, people always say, you know, if everybody mixed races and and we were just all mixed blending together, you know, the world would be better. That, that that you know, whether it's that shit or or something else, he says, what is at the core of that statement? What is at the core of that statement? The core of that statement is a is an anxiety about black. And he says, everywhere I look in biracial literature, I see an anxiety about black. I say in Palestine, I don't say Palestinians aren't suffering from Israelis. What I see is an anxiety about black. I see it in Tel Aviv. I see it in Gaza. In Cuba, the best country in the world, I see an anxiety about black. An anxiety about black, without an anxiety about black, people could not exist in their relational dynamics, full stop. Without that anxiety, there could be no white families, there could be no white nations, there could be no Native American families. 
And anxiety about blackness is like the grain of sand around which the mucus forms to create being. That is an argument which we have documented. In fact, we're not the first people to document that. For non-documents that, but he says something that we disagree with. He says, by talking it through, you can get beyond that. No. You don't, no. No, Mm. no. By ending the world, you can get beyond that. And you can't even know it's beyond that. You you, you can't, because people talk, people don't, the unconscious doesn't speak you don't speak the unconscious. It speaks you. The only thing you speak is your preconscious. But there's another engine inside of you that's that's generating all the things that you do, and it's generating them in symptomatic gestures, symptomatic actions. Okay, you cannot you cannot teach the unconscious. It is an unteachable part of the brain. It can be traumatized. It can be destroyed. It. Can, it's not that it cannot be changed, but it cannot be changed through dialogue. Okay, now, now, pawn queen thing very quickly. What what I, I I did a very quick gloss of this before I said that that what I'm most interested in putting down tracks of before I die is an analytic of embodied capacity. Okay, because I think there's too much, especially in the Anglo-American world. I've talked all over the world. And the Anglo-American world is the worst world for thinking theoretically because British and American people think about what they can see and touch and they develop their theories from that. You cannot understand a relational dynamic based upon empiricism and observation. You have to go very much deeper, which is why it's easier, ironically, for me to teach Germans, fascist-ass Germans, in grad school than it is to teach Americans because they don't need the tactile evidence of their experience to understand (laughs) what's going on, okay? So I said that a pawn has a certain capacity. It can move two spaces when it first starts and then one diagonally. A queen has a certain capacity. She can move diagonally across the board and vertically and horizontally across the board. So those are capacities that are different. And you said to me that in the game of chess, the pawn can actually, in some moves, become a queen. I agree with you. But that's not the end of our analysis. Our analysis then says, what is the, what is, how do we understand the spatial terrain on which the pawn and the queen operate? So it's both the temporal terrain, what can a pawn and a queen do over time, and what, and what is the space? And the spatial terrain, is that it goes like this. The queen can move all kinds of ways, but one thing she cannot do, she cannot jump off the chessboard, move around to the back, and attack the king on the other side from the back. Your queen ass has to stay on the chessboard in the world, okay? And so this is the this is the deepening of the analysis because from our point of view, the chessboard is the world spatially, and the pieces are the world spatially and temporally. And what we were saying is that there's another piece and it's called the checkers piece, which has no place in the world of chess. It is, and you know that it has no place in the world of chess. You know that a checkers, what is a queen ultimately? She's not a pawn, she's not a rook, she's not a bishop, but essentially how are they all chess pieces? Which is to say, how are they all human beings? Because they are not, a checkers piece. They are in the world. They have varying degrees of relational power, but they're in the world of chess. The checkers piece is important, is essential because it helps them understand what their world is. And what I'm saying is black people are the checkers piece. They're not in the world. They're not of the world, but they are necessary if the world is to know who they are and what their boundaries are. We are an essential embodiment for everybody else to understand. I am alive because I'm not black. So then you have this, if I'm not mistaken in Afro-pessimism, this is your only real uh, uh, exploration of mixed race, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I'm even forgetting here, I, I, I clipped it here in my notes, but I don't even have here who the she is that I'm talking about. But 
uh, the part the, the part I'm quoting here, you said she carried with her the ensemble of dilemmas that seems to afflict mixed race children into adulthood, a fear of slipping into the darkness of their black side and without ever having to ascend to the light of white redemption. And for my part, I resented the fact that she was born with this crisis and I was not a crisis in which I was I as a dark skinned person with no whiteness in my features was the living, breathing image of the hell into which she could descend. Yeah. Yeah, I'm having all kinds of personal reactions to that. I don't know how <laughs> how 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 well it captures my own experience. I don't know I don't know if I should feel a certain kind of way about that. Uh but I don't ever I don't anyway, so my first reaction was I've never thought of the, the of my potential blackness or the descent into blackness as hell. I always thought it as thought of it and still do as redemptive itself. Um, yeah. but, 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 but I know you're not talking about me or to me, but I just, that was my reaction. I had a very problem. I was like, hold up, Frank, <laughs> hold up now. Anyway, but go ahead, man. What, what, say something yeah. else about that. If you, will. what does that mean? Well, well, actually, uh, I, I hope, you know, since this is a trade book for the general public, there are not little footnote numbers at the end of every little thing I, I say, and there are footnotes at the back, which are embedded through, like, if you see, if you read a phrase that is that you don't know where it's coming from, you could turn to the back and perhaps you will see where that phrase comes from. Um, I hope I didn't just plagiarize, uh, but really that's not, that's that comes from uh, uh, Black Skin White Mass, uh, the woman of color and the white man. And, you know, I would, I would, mm. I would agree with you um, partially, Jared. I, I don't, I, I want us to be buddies. Pun intended. That's funny. <laughs> Go ahead, man. But but uh, in other words, I I say that you're saying that blackness is an an enabling universe for you, not a descent into the abyss. I would I would argue that you are telling the truth at the level of pre-conscious. But if I put you on the couch for three years and you knew that nothing that you said was going to be repeated and you just talked and talked and talked, I think we would find some contradictions, not just in you, but in me also in the unconscious. In other words, in other words, and this is why I said at the very beginning of our show that if when Fanon goes to heaven, he needs to meet David Marriott and say, hey, dude, uh, how can I reread my own work without all the sentimentality? Because what David Marriott is suggesting is that one of the constituent elements of suffering as a black person is to have not just a, a mind that is consciously aware of aggressivity from the outside, but to have an unconscious mind that is constantly tormented by a dual demand, the demand to destroy one's imago or guard itself against it. So in other words, in other words, what I'm suggesting is that our conscious mind and our unconscious mind in relation to blackness is at odds with, with each other. That my Palestinian friend is not just some Palestinian dude who hates black, that I am too. That, that in my unconscious, blackness presents anxiety. Now, how I deal with that anxiety can be highly progressive, but, I'm, but I do not believe that there's any black person walking around who has no anxiety about their own about being black and no, no need to destroy themselves as an image in their unconscious mind. I would just, I, so, and I, and I, and I think that Fanon has proven that symptom by symptomatically following my, my capacia in that chapter, in this moment when, and you know, he basically says, he says, look, how do I know I'm in a world? How do I, and he doesn't mean how do I know I say I'm in a world. He's not talking about what you say about yourself. He's talking about how does your unconscious know you're in a world? Your unconscious knows you're in a world by your, by the level of your proximity to whiteness. When my capacia is going through all this anxiety and, and, and about, you know, she's got this French general uh, officer lover who's, who's she's fathered a child he's fathered a child through her 
Uh, he, the dude won't accept the child. You know, she wants to go to the social club in, in Port-au-Prince, you know, where the French hang out. He, she, you know, she's in love with this dude. He won't bring her to the social club. He finally brings her and the women treat her, the white women treat her like shit, you know, and she's going through all this stuff, you know, and, and then Fanon is saying, what's going on here? And he looks at her symptomatic gestures. He doesn't ask her, hey, what do you think about yourself? Okay, because what's she gonna say? I am a black woman who's an anti-black racist and I hate myself to bits. Okay? No, okay, come on now, let's be for real, okay? And he says, oh, well, here's something. Uh, in grade school, she, she took an inkwell from her desk and a dude she was mad at and she poured all the ink on top of his head. Hmm, uh, she's a laundress and she rubs her knuckles to the bone, uh, making sure the, the sheets that she washes with her hands are just perfectly white, and she brags about how white she gets to treat. He's, she's, he's reading her symptomatic gestures at like breadcrumbs back to grandmother's house and saying, I see at the core of her unconscious a desire of hallucinatory whitening to turn black, white or disappear. Boom. Then one day she hears a story, and the story is that her grandfather, who's a black Martinican, had her mother through a white Canadian woman, which she never knew. And all of a sudden, her bodily chemistry changes. She's able to smile again because this is a white woman with a black man. It's a gift. Her mother is a gift. Not her mother was a child of a black woman with a white man. That would be a baby made in the bushes. No, the white woman is a gift, okay? And she can now move through the world with a kind of, with less turmoil in the stomach, with a smile on her face, okay? This is a description of a structural dynamic that is not singular to my capacia. Marriott is saying this is the unconscious there's no such thing as a black unconscious that is not tormented by its own imago. Now, what Fanon is saying is that, and he doesn't say it very well in, in white, Black Skin, White Mass, because he's writing this book with his wife, right? He's dictating this book. She's typing it. He's trying not to offend her because he's- His what white he, wife, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah, I just want to be clear. I just want to be clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's trying not to offend her. Oh, that's deep. He's, okay. He's, but he's also, and I'm not condemning him for this. You know, I understand that sentiment perfectly. But he's also trying to say, you and I are going to have this great marriage where we're not in an antagonistic dynamic if we harness the tools of, of, of the talking cure to get beyond where we are. And you know what happens? Every chapter ends in a cul-de-sac, okay? Because what he runs up against is that they're not of the same species. She's the master. He's the slave. She's the human. He's the black. And he can't. And he's so much a victim of the time. He's so much uh, suffering from a terminal disease that I call clientitis where psychoanalysis is his client, that, he's, that he believes that something of an essential relation can happen between me and her. When, so he, he dictates all this evidence, then he gets there, oh shit, where am I at? You know, and he cuts it off. We have to read his own book as a form of tormented suffering. So all I'm gonna say is that, um... I would be the exception that proves the rule and I would fuck up that couch. <laughs> but that is not an argument against your work. So that's all I'm saying. I, I just would, I just want to, I just take myself out of that equation and that I put myself in, but that's, 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 that's deep. Um, listen, so, so essentially I've gone over with you the, 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 I've gotten from you what I had hoped to get from so far, from you for so far in this conversation. I want to make sure, I do want to check the chat, which is always dangerous to see if there are any questions that, that we can grab real quick. But 
I also want to make sure that that if there's nothing that I've invited you to say about Afro pessimism, the book or the idea, the the meta theory, broadly speaking, that you would like to say uh, um, or a point that you want to elaborate on, please do. Um, okay, there's one thing. Yeah, sure. Uh, an, an an NPR uh, 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 interviewer, a National Public Radio in Texas, uh, got to the end of the interview and um, she. You know, and she did this thing, even though I said from the very beginning, it's pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. It's not an emotional dispensation. You know, perhaps we should have taken a different name, but Sadia Hartman gave us this name back in 2002 and we ran with it, you know. Um, and she says, well, is there any joy in Afro-pessimism? And I said, look, there is, but what makes me happy might very well terrify you. And my point is, is that, People who are who are doing all these these uh, ad hominem attacks on me, which is fine, you know, because I live for new enemies. That's great, you know, bring it on. But also understand that what you are doing is making a sentimental response to a deeply analytic set of research books and papers that are that are that have been coming out for the past twenty years. Um, you have to you have to understand. Ask yourself why is it that so many Black youth, Black lumpen are struggling with the vernacular of Afro-pessimism in the way that the, the, the 18, 19, and 20-year-old kids that I was teaching Antonio Gramsci to in Pimville, Soweto, after they came back from the United Nations Food Bank, why were they? Why are so many Black people on ground struggling with this and finding, and why are Black youth in the debate world being energized by this. Um, and I think that what happens is that a lot of black scholars don't understand that um, we are not in a privileged position because we have research one tenure track jobs. We are just in a different form of psychic domination, okay? And that all black speech is coerced speech. Every black person is in prison, regardless if you're driving a Benz or a Bentley, or, or if you're, I, I just made chancellor's professor. I'm very happy about that. That doesn't mean that I'm free. Okay, there are only, you know, it's, it's a great honor. There's 3000 professors. There's only 50 chancellor's professors. Okay. I didn't get there because the, the white people. I've never even heard of this. I don't even know what the hell this is. I, I haven't even heard of this shit before. So. Is a title based upon your distinguished contribution to, to research. But you know what? Congratulations. It shows you also how far away from that 50 I am. I never even heard of the damn thing, but I'm just. <laughs> well, but, but, my, but my point is, I never tried to get it. Okay. The mm -hmm. university has always been, I am always a parasite, and the university is my host. I'm a parasite on its resources to do the work that I need to do for expanding the territory of, of Black knowledge of antagonism. And, you know, I, the last thing I'll say is I was an adjunct professor once. And I've always spoken the way I speak, whether I have a tenure track job or a part-time job. And there were some people of color professors who had done this human relations workshop at UC Santa Cruz, uh, wanting all the people to come together for, for the, the first year students, you know. And one of them said, you know, this isn't just about Black. That statement, whenever people hear that, this isn't just about Black. That's just what Jared Sexton is talking about with, with these mixed race uh, discourses. I'm not just Black. You, he's saying, statistically speaking, nobody says, I'm not just white, okay? You know, you're, uh, you, Jared Ball, the exception to, to the rule. I'm not going to, I'm not going to make comments on your, on your, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, as soon as we get into these groups, these, these circles of, of human relations type groups, you know, for these uh, college students, there's this undertow of shaming that happens for black students. And I can say this to you because I know from other people that you don't do this, but most academics do do this. Like y'all gotta be cool. Y'all gotta do this. Y'all gotta understand that, you know, it's not just about you, you know? And I, and I felt that going on in the focus group, right? And so, and one of the professors said to the kids, I don't want y'all to just be complaining. Tell us about 
What makes you happy? You got to you got to move around the room and tell me one thing that makes you happy. And I watch the torment on these kids' faces as they living in fucking Santa Cruz, okay? One of the most mm-hmm. anti-black places in the world, having to come up with something that make, make them happy, you know. And 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 when they when you know they were having choices, well, let's see the instructors can lead by example. And and they said to me, so Frank, what makes you happy? And I said, what makes me happy is when I'm walking down Shattuck Avenue up in Berkeley, and I see all the houses in the Berkeley Hills burning to the ground. That's what <laughs> makes me happy. And you know what happened? You know what happened? Yeah, just that, what you just did. Those kids bust their gut, okay? And now they were now we were happy, okay? And the fucking administrator and the and the professors, they had to deal with that. Okay, yeah, that's what makes me happy. Listen, after one of the video look, in in I was watching uh uh I was again trying to do some homework on the criticism. And I watched a a Lewis Gordon discussion with Hortense Spillers. And on the one hand, uh, I was, no disrespect, I just didn't, I admit, I didn't understand. It was never clear to me what she was saying you were saying was was a problem. It was just clear she was saying she had a problem with what you were saying. And I just kept waiting for the explanation and it was never made clear to me. But one thing that, it was in that discussion where Gordon makes the point about the debate scene and that that it's white instructors and white funding that's imposing Afro-pessimism on these unsuspecting black kids in the ghetto. And that this was destabilizing and gonna have an untold negative impact. Uh, And the one thing, the first thing I thought of honestly was how does he know that? I don't even know how you would assess that. (laughs) But I did reach out, you know, I, you know, honestly, so, but I reached out to a good friend of mine who comes out of that scene uh, uh, um, and knows it well. Um, and I asked him, you know, to what extent, you know, um, and sort of what I understood you to be saying is what I understood him to be saying that, yes, it was in many cases that Afro pessimism was introduced to these black kids by these white instructors of these debate camps, but that they were doing something very different with it or taking it, um, uh, on their own and looking to adapt it for their own, in many cases, black nationalist race first analysis purposes uh so on one hand i just wanted to 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 say that but to also ask again you know and and even one of some of the questions in the chat are are asking in different ways is not what you're doing an update or another twist on a race first analysis in other words you know is, is some of the reaction people are having to you even maybe just in part even without engaging your work uh, a visceral one that they've been having to to the so-called Garveyites and the cultural nationalists uh, in other areas for their whole academic or intellectual lives. Yeah, but the uh, black nationalism, race first, all that those were those were movements. This is an this is an analytic lens, and people are doing something with it. We, there, you cannot read anywhere in Afro pessimism based upon what we've analyzed about anti blackness and social death. Here's what you should do boom, 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 boom. That is completely missing, deliberately missing, because how can you talk about the end of the world? Okay. We're saying that black people don't suffer essentially from being poor. Black people don't suffer essentially from being immigrants. Black people don't suffer essentially from being in prison. Black people suffer essentially from a form of violence an accumulation that is based on nothing but their blackness and the need for their, you know, in every community, there has to be aggressivity. Why is there aggressivity? Because the hydraulics of repression are necessary for a community to exist. You and I have been speaking English, but we've been speaking through a repression called grammar. If you went off script, like you did a tab of LSD, right now, and you started hallucinating and you started using grammar any way you saw fit, and you broke through the repression of the rules of the social dynamics of language, we could not have a community of relational dynamics here. So what I'm saying is that any any pressure, pressure on the brain, repression is not a bad word. It's an, It's necessary for communities to be. But re- repression, produces aggression because 
like little kids doing word games or like people who want to, you know, uh, you, you know, you say you cannot sleep with your mother, you cannot sleep with your father, you cannot sleep with horses, okay? And yet, I don't, I didn't know this until this grad student came to me up from the dark web wanting to do a dissertation on bestiality. There are people who sleep with, have sex with animals. There are people who have sex with their parents. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that the repression of Oedipus, which structures the nuclear family, produces a way of people to have a stable relation with each other, but it cannot guard against the needs of the unconscious to go in all kinds of directions. And that produces aggression. And what Fanon writes is that aggressivity needs a destination. Now in so-called primitive societies, they have rituals, they wear masks, they burn things in effigies. In the world, the black is the destination for all aggressivity. We are the destination for all aggressivity. And if you want to know how that works, read chapter six of Black and White, Na White Mass. He talks about the, 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 the white woman in the, in the um, gendered family, uh, the, 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 the Negro in psychopathology. Now, um, sorry, go, go to the last part of your question. I'll be very quick. What was, what was the last? Oh, man, I don't even remember. What was it? Uh... Yeah. Um, oh, the debate, so, the debate thing, the debate thing, the debate, yeah. Oh, the so, debate part, right. Sorry yeah, about that. Wow. So, so, so here's the deal. This is where people need an institutional, need better institutional history and less of this kind of shooting from the hip. Back in about 2008, two Black students from your neck of the woods, Towson University, right over, like near, near D.C., uh, Simply closer to Baltimore to be fair to the region. I don't want to sorry, cause sorry, any sorry. trouble here. I just want to be fair. <laughs> it's all East Coast to be outside. <laughs> I hear you. Right. But just to be fair to the region, I don't want to get closer to Baltimore. Any, any more trouble than we're already in. <laughs> okay. Anyway, yeah. Um, two black two black debaters won a, a national tournament against Howard, Harvard University by simply reading into the record a letter that my wife and I wrote to the faculty of Cabrillo Community College in Incognito. And it basically said, it's not that you are making bad choices in hiring and firing, it's that you have no right to be even to exist. You have no right to be engaged in the capacity of hiring and firing. And, the, and from that, they used that letter to then make the argument that we are not going to answer the debate question pro or con. We are going to say that that question is a question that exists for people on a chessboard, to get back to my metaphor, and to say that we are interrogating the right of civil society and citizens to exist, not the, not the things that they do in civil society. And you know what? They won that national debate, okay? This was, this was not George Soros. This was not white debate uh, 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 coaches. These are two black students who had this idea. Let's use this letter as an anecdote to make a springboard to free us from answering the question and interrogating the right for the question that exists. And they won the, and then it picked off, okay? Now, I am going to say to you, that because coaches want to win, some white coaches clicked on to teaching Afro-pessimism. But I have only dealt with one white debate coach, and I've dealt with many debate coaches, and that's a dude named David Pe Peterson, who always instantiated himself in the Black community, okay, with Black debate coaches, take it, being authorized by Black debate coaches. He's now teaching Afro-pessimism in China. OK, and so um, and so what I'm trying to say is that, yes, there are a lot of young people. Remember, these kids are 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, and they are experimenting with Afro-pessimism on their own terms. And sometimes I've been to some of their tournaments. Sometimes they get it wrong. I don't care. I don't care. That's how I got to where I was. I am, you know, experimenting with existentialism, experimenting with postcolonialism, experimenting with 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 Marxism, uh, hanging out with SDS, uh, Students for Democratic Society, in 1970, hanging out with the Panthers. I, that's what youthful people do. 
they experiment. And so it is not necessary for me that they deploy Afro-pessimism in their debates to the letter of my analytic apparatus. It is just necessary for me that they engage. I'm just happy that they engage. And, and you know, you could say to me, uh, not you, but they could, the, the, the naysayers could say, well, you know, George Soros is de deploying this, uh, you sh just because he has put money into these debate camps, you shouldn't let Afro pessimism go go down that route. You could also say because um, W W Norton is not an Afro pessimist press, I should not have published this book there. But do you know how many people in the world, black people in the world, who have gotten this book now, who did not get Red, White, and Black, or even Incognito? Okay, so there's no such thing as a black world. There's no such thing as a black institutional dynamic. There's no such thing as a black publishing dynamic. There are, I'm not saying they're not black published. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is that we are captive. We are captive. And how we use the tools of captivity is going to, is going to vary. I believe in my heart of hearts that I've used those tools with great integrity. Uh, I should also point out two quick other things, two other two other things quickly one uh if we're if we're doing the 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 um making the adjustments to our quote-unquote reality it should never be through lsd mushrooms only let's <laughs> let's, let's 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 clarify that point and then uh, i should also clarify that the person that 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 i reached out to would probably also want me to know because i think he was one of the people involved with that that victory over harvard uh, -huh. uh that that uh while it may have taken place through Towson, the 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 participants all come from Baltimore. So I just or or, or were led through Baltimore. So I just want to be clear on that also. Like again, and, and, I'm trying to keep it together regionally. Yeah. I don't want and for me, let me say something on my, on my own behalf. I, you know, several years ago, I got lots of calls from white debate coaches, even 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 uh a high school white debate coach in Chevy Chase, Maryland, right? Mm -hmm. Saying, hey, uh and I needed money. I don't need money right now. I needed money then. Okay. Say, so, hey, if you come out to uh, Northwestern, if you come out to Michigan State, if you come out to Chevy Chase and do some workshops for our white debate students on Afro pessimism, we will pay you some buku cash. You know, I called the crew out in out in Baltimore, and I said, I said, this is some good money. I need, and they said, no, don't do that. They are training these white kids in Afro pessimism so that they can beat us. Beat you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, to this day, have not accepted one dime from those people. So this would be part of my my response off the record when a lot of people would come, and, and I don't mean a lot. I don't want to exaggerate, but 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 it feels you know a number of people would come to me with with their uh, uh, again off the record criticisms of my interaction with you when I would say, but everything. That's the version of Frank that I have to say I'm accustomed to that I that I'm aware of. So I don't I don't really, you know. Anyway, uh, uh, this is a question here that I that, that, you know, we've had you on on our airwaves at WPFW. Again, shout out to Katia Stitt and others uh, in conversation with Daruba bin Wahad uh, uh, and I believe several others coming out of that. Uh, BLA political prisoner world. But but this question here about how does your work uh um support or not the work of the black liberation army or or what what you know so as we started off i've never understood your work to discourage black radical political in activity uh some of the critics claim that your work does here's a direct question about how your work would interact or does or does not interact with the the bla uh, or the, well, that history the the the, the bla has been so important to me over ever since I got back, you know, well, actually before that, because in 1987, uh, Sada's book came out from Zed Publishing in London. And then a year later in 88, it came out through Lawrence Hill. And I was teaching Asada's work in 87 at the Loft Literary Center, a, a course called our, um, Reading the Memoir, for memoir writers, okay? That was before I had any, even before I'd even gotten to Ever Said, okay? So I, I fundamentally believe that um, we have to keep 
I, you know, like with my friend Akinale Umoja, we have to keep the BLA front and center because it's too easy for white radicals to have a kind of fuzzy love affair with the Black Panther Party and not to um, celebrate, acknowledge, and and um, just say, like you would say to anyone who served in Iraq, right? What I say to all Black Liberation Army soldiers, thank you for your service. Um, so I, I'm i working on a thank you for your service, right? <laughs> um, Move to the front of the plane, please. Exactly. Move to the front of the line, please. Exactly. exactly. You're in the BRA, you fly in first class, okay? <laughs> So, so I have at least three highly analytic articles that I've written on the, on the BLA. I spent a year in Germany uh, thinking through the structural dynamic of what it meant to be in an, a, a soldier in an armed, a liberation armed struggle who is black compared to someone in the uh, Red Army faction or, 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 or Bader Meinhof gang. You know, I've my next book w will is fiction and it will engage those themes in some way. And the book after that will probably, if I live that long and get it all together, will probably grow the three articles that I published on the Black Liberation Army into a small book uh, in and of itself. I really think that we have to, having been involved in armed struggle in South Africa, I really think it's important that we move from the energy of of civil disobedience and this word that I keep hearing all the time on Amy Goodman, you know, peaceful, peaceful, peaceful civil disobedience, and to acknowledge and celebrate people who have picked up the gun against the most horrible institution in the world, the United States of America. Now, th that though, if the work is highly theoretical, I won't go into it too deeply. But one of the things that it is also saying, my work on Asada's book, um, and and not just my work, you know. For example, being a chancellor's professor, the dean asked me, can we put your picture on a banner that will hang on lampposts uh, in the School of Humanities at UC Irvine? And uh, on the banner, it'll, it'll, re, you know, it'll have something to do with your research, which is on the Black Panther Party and its creation in 1966. That's what the communication office asked me. And I came back to them, I said, I really don't write on the Panthers. I write on the Black Liberation Army. And I and you know, and I said all black speech is under coercion. I was queasy in my stomach. I see a sod up on the wall behind you, you know. And I said, I said, um, I said, um, you know, I if you want a fair representation of me on this poster, and then you're gonna have this like uh, barcode where you where you put your cell phone up to it and you click on and it sends you to my research, you're not gonna go to research on the Panthers. I do research on the Black Liberation Army. So I think we need to kind of skew the poster for that, you know? And um, I, I thought they would come back with me and say, hell no, you know? And, uh, but they said, yes. And so that's what I've done. I've, against all odds, you know, emotional odds in this horrible county called Orange County, I have used uh, university money to bring Seiko Odenga uh, to campus uh, to speak, got all kinds of hate mail from the white people. What, what about a cop killer, you know? Well, he's a cop killer, that's why I brought him, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I was on hand. I, I still think to this day one of your coldest lines was when we were we were we were you know and and we were live and direct, and you said uh, I don't I don't hate police violence or police brutality. I hate the police. And you know, that joint, I was like, that's a cold line. There's a there's a right wing uh, institute in Arizona that's actually set, a few days ago sent me that line and said we, we you know we found your name in a in a liberally biased syllabus at Arizona and can you comment on that I they, that like that was years ago that was almost 20 years ago <laughs> and these people they dig up shit all the time anyway so my here's but here's my point in my book and my articles there's two things that are going on at the same time one is a celebration of I could not be where I am as a thinker if if Asada Daruba um uh what's Herman Bell's other name uh um uh, no no, it's a Herman Bell. Yeah. Herman and, Bell, uh, yeah. Yeah. I thought he had an African uh, Seiko Odenga and and yeah. uh Jalil Montakim, you mm -hmm. know, 
when I taught at community college, I made these white students in Santa Cruz write letters to the Black Liberation Army as they were studying the text, you know, and was almost fired for that. So what I'm trying to say is that my capacity to think as clearly and as antagonistically without without apology and without giving the United States some corner in my brain, some corner in my writing for its capacity to transform. My, my unabashed desire and analysis of, it, of the need for it to be destroyed could not happen without Asada, you know? But it couldn't happen with Huey, you know? Huey changed up on me when I was 16 years old, okay? I mean, you know what I'm saying? I mean, bless his heart and everything, but you know, he started talking to this, you know, I was I was a, like a junior in high school. He started this intercommunal bullshit and everything, you know, with his little squeaky ass voice. And I just- Man, like, but I like, I like intercommunalism. I think he's okay, right. I, I don't- I, I'm sorry, I, I, and, and I will back up on that. I'll back up on that because I don't remember enough about it to actually, to actually critique it. What I'm trying to say is that- I hear you. As a as a older teenager, watching the debates between Eldridge and Huey, you know, or Eldridge from from Algeria, and 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 then seeing what was happening in New York, not my analytic understanding was in any way cap capable, but my my energy was mobilized by this entity that was becoming, Matula Shakur, the the BLA, you know, and I visited. Marilyn Buck many times in prison when I was in grad school. And so, you know, and, and Jalil and I have been pen pals for a while, you know. I think where, where I have, I have a, I have what I, the way I teach Asada is to say, here at the level of pre-conscious interest, remember I got back to the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. She is saying, I'm an internationalist. She is saying, I'm a Marxist Leninist. She is saying that the essential nature of suffering is between the haves and the have-nots. That's what she's saying in her work. However, I'm reading, I'm doing a symptomatic reading of her work where see in the symptoms of her writing. Uh, Frank, I think we're having, hold on a second. I think we're having a bad connection. You're not coming through very clearly here. Um, I don't want to lose, it, it figures that you, you talked about Asada and all of a sudden the connection got bad there for a second. Um, and it looks like you're a little frozen there as well. Damn. Okay, you know? I'll, I'll uh, know. A little bit better, yeah, please continue. Sorry okay. about that. I'll be very brief and very very simple. What I'm saying is that the BO... Damn, I think we lost you again, Frank. Just as you started to say the BLA, I don't know what's going on here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, the feds um, come on the show if they want to talk. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, uh, now you seem to be a little bit more clear. Let's try one more time with where you were. I'm going to try to be very, very briefly. Uh, I see in the writing of the BLA two layers of analysis. One is what they say about the problem. And two is how the problem exists through their symptomatic narration. So what I'm trying to say is that, is that I am here today because of their actions, because of their energy, and because of what they wrote. And the sense that I'm getting from Asada's autobiography consciously is that the war is between the rich and the poor. But the sense that I get from the unconscious analysis of it is that I, Asada, suffer as a Black in, in an essential way that is different than my suffering as a poor person. And that's what my book mm -hmm. will be about. That's what my articles are about. Um, and so I'll, I'll end it there before the FBI decides they want to cut us off again. No, I think you seem pretty good right now. And in fact, I want to, if, if we can, uh, um, work in a few more of these questions. One of which you just raised, uh, you, you, you made reference, and it's asking here about... Uh, why do you rest so heavily on just one concept, the collective unconsciousness? And your analytic, in, if your analytic is based on deeply researched conceptual work, why does it rest so heavily on just one concept, the collective unconscious? I don't think it does rest on on, yeah, on just one concept. Um, yeah. So so that's just not, yeah. I don't. Yeah, I would say please read red, white, and black, so that you understand. Uh, because in that book, I interrogate psychoanalysis, I interrogate 
indigenism and I interrogate Marxism and I interrogate white feminism all in that one book. Yeah, uh, admitted, yeah, admittedly, uh, but I mean, I, well, that's interesting you said that because I'm thinking, you know, because I struggle so much reading that book that when I read Afro pessimism, I feel like you answer that question in this book as well. Uh, I don't, I don't feel like I think you explain how you use psychoanalysis, yeah. but I don't feel like it. It the, the collective unconscious is is what yeah, dominates it's, the. No, it's just one piece of the puzzle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the only other thing I just I, I think you've sort of answered this, but uh, sort of just in, in some of the comments and questions I'm seeing here is is this question of uh, like my brother uh, Kaba asked just very directly uh, if I can find it again. But why why do you think in particular black Marxists have so much of a tr struggle with Afro pessimism? I mean, I know like I, I have a, a, a tremendous affinity for the black Marxists and communist histories and traditions um, and for Marxist analysis. In my own mind, I actually, and I know this is going to sound, you know, maybe upsetting to everybody. I don't see, um, I don't see the levels of uh, antagonism or contradiction between all of these 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 camps that that some see. But um, but that's for another day, another time. From your perspective, why why do you think, in particular, this this issue you, that Afro pessimism is is a problem for Black Marxists? Um, yeah. Uh, I don't really know. Um, you know, I, <clears throat> you know, I hit, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Go ahead. No, in fact, let me, I'm going to, let me do it this way. This is, this is a better way. Um, if I can quickly find, I want to quickly find this, this, uh, cause that email exchange I referred to, uh, I think, if I could find it real quick, I should have pulled it up and just read it from the beginning. But, but, in other words, the 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 the, the hostility in the message that I responded to, uh, and the 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 snide re the response I got in return was that I and well, you and by extension me were not understanding the fundamental uh, um, basis of of white supremacy being in capital and colonial dominance. And in fact, in that nation article, you explicitly say that, that anti-blackness cannot, the, the, it cannot be seen as generating just out of capital and colonialism and enslavement. Uh, obviously from a Marxist perspective, that would be a, a fundamental challenge, but, but um, anyway, why is that? Why do you make that argument? And why why is the, the the Marxist analysis in terms of the origins of racism not satisfactory for you? Well, having having just criticized Anglo American pedagogues for being uh, empiricists, I'm going to get on an empiricist tip myself for just a minute here. Look, man, I was 17 when I went to the Soviet Union. Just a died in the world communist, you know. And it was just the, the the grooviest thing in the world. And then one day I was at a at a, at a bar, you know, and I was hanging out with with um, the Soviets were bringing in all these people from Black Africa to train them, both militarily, and um, and in economics and to train them in in medicine. And I was sitting at a table with uh, an an Egyptian, a Ghanaian, uh, a Nigerian, and I think another person from another part of Africa. It was about two in the morning. And you know, I thought, oh, this is this is heaven, you know, this is this is like this is the communist world that I always dreamed of. You know, we were getting drunk and and uh, and it was it was just let's say it was something out of like like a, a storybook because one of the white Russians brought in a real bear on a on a chain, you know, and and Russian people like they 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 walk sometimes they used to walk bears the way we walk dogs, you know, brought in a bear on a chain and and people were dancing and stuff like that, you know. And as we got sloshed, I just said to the to the Africans, I said, this is just the this is this is this is what I'm dreaming of. You know, this is what the, the world will be like when communism takes over the world. And one cat says to me, yeah, as long as you don't rock up at their house to date their daughters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and here's me, 17 years old. This cat's like a 25. And I'm arguing with his ass. No, 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 no. You're just, you're, there, there's no racism. You know, he says, he says, 
they're training us and they want they want Soviet hegemony, but but we can't we can't, you know, date these women, you know. And then another dude, a friend of mine later did a research on white women, black women in, in uh, uh, East and West Germany. He says there's a whole lot more happening in East Germany of, of black cats being able to date white women as long as they're over the age of 45 or 50. You know, in other words, what I mean is what he's what his book is suggesting is that the farther away these white women get from their institutional web, the easier it is to slip into blackness. Um, you know, then one of the cats in the Soviet Union at this bar, he wanted, he said, um, I think I think James Brown's hot pants was was all the rage back then, you know, uh, this is 1973. And he had hot pants on a 45 and they were spinning records at the top. And he went over to the, the dude at the front of the, the, the bar and says, can you play this for us? And the people went berserk. You know, no, we're not playing this. We're not, you know, what I'm trying to say is that yes, the Soviet Union is better than West Germany. Cuba is better than the Soviet Union. But what did I just say at the very beginning? Anti-Black anxiety organizes everybody's reality. Capitalists, communists, anything in between. Um, man, I know, look, I know we're, we're pushing up on two hours. I don't want to, uh, I, I just know that, that, I guess I I guess I'm just hearing in my head what I know would be the at least part of the response from from a materialist camp that even the story you're just des describing comes at the tail end of however many hundreds of years of enslavement and colonialism and the reproduction of of uh I don't know anti the, the social relations of anti blackness and in 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 capitalist relations et cetera and so on and had we not gone through that and could we ever go back and you know recreate or create a new a socialist communist world that this would all dissipate uh or at least be be mitigated because historically in human society we haven't seen the kind of racism and anti blackness we see today yeah but um, if, that, if yeah. that if that response was a train, if that response was a train going from LA to New York City, I'd get off at Cincinnati and I'll tell you why. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Because capitalism in, in the global histor history of anti-Blackness, capitalism is a relatively new paradigmatic formation, number one. Number two, when three, three to 400 years ago, when capitalism actually begins to emerge, it doesn't actually have to go the way it goes. There's mercantilism that is emerging out of France and a, a certain kind of mercantilism that's emerging out of, out of the Netherlands. And it, is, and it is the capacity of the British Isles to, to hegemize, hegemonize its social economic structure that makes for capitalism to actually dominate over a certain forms of mercantilism that could have saturated the globe, okay? So it doesn't actually have to be, that's number one. The number two thing is that anti-Blackness starts a thousand years before capitalism with the Arabs. So, I mean, this, these people are just being historically inaccurate, okay? Because they're like Fanon with psychoanalysis, they're suffering from a terminal degree called clientitis where Marxism is their client. What can I say? At my point, the way I've tried to rationalize it so that people in this world at this time can move and not get bogged down in these disagreements is to say, even if Marxists are correct, uh, um, or the starting point is is European enslavement, the fact is all of this still happened and we are what we are. Uh, and that even at this point, a return or a, an advance to socialism or communism wouldn't take care of uh, psychologically the anti-blackness that would have been so, made so essential over the last several hundred years anyway. Yeah. So uh, um, this is why, to me, when people are, are so have such a certain uh, 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 anti uh, or antagonistic response to your work, I'm. I don't know. I just don't get it. I mean, it's it's one thing to not fully agree or whatever, whatever. But there's there there does I don't know. And I and I always just whittle it down to you are offering up for what many is simply put a race first analysis, and people um, don't 
many people don't want that. And then many people don't want it in the form that you're offering it, which is why I still think it's confusing to me that uh, some of these white liberal spaces uh, would, would want to engage your work. Cause I don't, I'm not fully sure they're they're Anyway, I, I always think they're not getting what you're they're saying. Not but, but engaging, they're saying. not engaging in the work. It's a form of, uh, it's a form of Negrophilia. Like okay. white boys in the suburbs buying more rap albums than black. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not dumb, okay. I don't, I don't believe that I actually have a relationship with white people. <laughs> no, in fact, you say very clearly in your book, you, you, you don't. I mean, and then even in your most close personal relationships, it's still master slave, which is just, woo, Frank, damn. Uh, anyway, um, it's just a lot. But listen, man, I, I look, uh, I think. Anyway, I feel like we've covered a lot. You've been gracious with your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, my set of questions has been exhausted. It, again, I, I you know, um, anyway, I encourage people to get the book and read Afro Pessimism uh, and, uh, and put it to some good use. And as we started, we'll end, we can end with, uh, you know, go ahead, go ahead. The, the paperback for people who want ten, to pay $10 less should be out in days to weeks. Uh, paperback edition for 18 dollars right on there you go however whatever medium you get it hard copy soft copy kindle whatever make sure you get the book and and check it out uh and uh share this video to supplement it as well please do like share and subscribe and frank man thank you very much again it's always it's always a pleasure to catch up with you likewise uh, I, I wish you the best man take good care thank you so much it's so good to see you again you take care take good care likewise likewise all right, everybody. Uh, appreciate you coming through. Appreciate the lively chat to the extent that I saw it and some of the questions you all provided. I hope that this discussion uh, has, um, if not answered some of your questions or concerns, uh, maybe added a few more, maybe added some, some responses you can offer in your extended conversations. I do encourage people again to read the book. Uh, come back tonight for Sundays with the Ear Doctor, of course, tomorrow morning. Uh, I'll be back with a whole bunch of guests, actually. Uh, we're going to be talking about political prisoners, black labor, a whole bunch of stuff. So, uh, uh, And I should have said this while he was on here, but but Frank and others no longer need to deal with Amy Goodman, as a, as a, particularly at 8 a.m. on Eastern Time in the morning, because we have, whether it's my show or the Remix Morning Show, we got you covered. So you can all just come on over here and get a, a much better starting point for your news and views and all of that good stuff. Anyway, thanks again to Frank Wilderson and everybody else for coming out. Um, uh, like Fred Hampton used to say to you, we say peace if you're willing to fight for it. So peace, everybody. Catch you all throughout this channel. And of course, tomorrow at 8 a.m. Eastern when we're back with I Mix What I Like live. So peace, everybody. Catch you next time. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. I like